box of total Ragnarok toys to play with. The X-Men animated series turns 25, and we've got some scary sounds that came from space. All that more right now on Up the It's that time of the Thursday again when we do this show noon. every Thursday. The time of the what noon. time is it? Noon. Ah, yes. Here. The time for Up at Noon. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Up at Noon. I'm Max Scoville. This is Brian Altano. And I'm this... really far away from you. Really? I've Shumbling. missed you. Come yeah, closer, you my too. darling. Um, oh, my tick fell. Well, that was... That went poorly. <laughs> anyway, our toys fell over. Up at Noon is a show where we get to talk about the stuff that we love, whether it's superhero movies or snacks or pizza or action figures or toys that are made for children, not adult collectors. We still play with them anyway. You say uh, pizza and snacks are different things? Because not in my universe. That's one and the same. Could be a meal. Could be an in-between time meal. I don't know what the quantity day. of snacks you have to consume for it to become a meal is, but I hope we can find out someday together. Anyway, if you're watching the show on whatever you're watching it on, you can also watch it on other things, such as YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, Roku, Apple TV, PS4, Xbox One, and I think we're probably on Mixer now. Yep. Um, we are currently looking at the chats for Twitch and YouTube. It's live, but there's also a lag, so... Uh, yeah, the Anarchist says it was really good. I liked how they added the Ragnarok theme song to it. Talking I don't, about the intro to the pro show. Probably, yeah. yes. Um, anyway, uh, let's let's get into the news. There's a bunch of cool stuff that's happened this week. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Paris Games Week happened this week, and it was there was like tons of stuff coming out of that. So go check out IGN if you haven't already. Lots of new game trailers and stuff about that. But one you of you guys the, did a Beyond on that, right? We did a whole episode of Beyond. I but, thought their languaging was a little weird because they said uh, E3 was only half the story. And I was like, you don't you don't have to do that. That's not how that works. That's it's just another um, conference. No, the really the really big news this week is that Thor Ragnarok is out in theaters. That comes out tonight. Uh, we've been talking about this movie for ages. It feels like. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's been. I remember hearing like rumors about it forever ago. The good news is uh, the verdict is in, and it seems like it is a pretty solid, safe bet that it is a fun movie. It is currently sitting at a rot or at a ninety-six percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, I think the only major detraction here is that it's too much fun. Like people are like, it's very silly, and it's like, well, that's that's a, it's about a large green man and a Norse god in space. Yeah, I'm, so, we've been tracking this movie for a while, and I think since we first started hearing about it, I was most excited about the idea of it being a sort of, like, kind of a one-off story that didn't necessarily move that whole story forward of the Civil War and the Infinity Gauntlet and all that. Mm -hmm. We're getting there. We'll get there. There'll be, like, nine movies about it and then spin-off movies about it. You'll get all that. But I think it's nice to, like, sort of have that feeling with a movie of what it was like to be a kid and walk into a store and just grab a random comic off the shelf and go home and read it. Yeah, like, like occasionally, I didn't, you know, reading comics, there are those, like, weird filler episodes, filler issues where something silly sort of happens. Like, yep. just, and it's just, you're like, this isn't dark and serious, like, plot moving forward stuff. This is just, like, a fun kind of junk food adventure. And that's, we need that here and there. There was, like, um, there were a lot of comics growing up that uh, were, like, 13-part series or, like, 50, 50 comics in a row that tell one story that became a trade paperback. Um, I didn't really buy Thor growing up. I liked the character. I liked the idea of him. Like, I had toys. I had uh, like trading cards and all that. But I bought a Thor comic every now and then when some cool stuff was going down. Yeah. And so something like this is exactly the kind of comic I would have seen that cover on the shelf and would have been like, well, this looks interesting, mm -hmm. and grabbed it and flipped through it and read it and been like, whoa, that's exactly what I needed from this. Yeah. So I think that, like, comic book movies have gotten a little bogged down in that they, everything is a universe, um, and sometimes it's kind of cool to see it shrink down a little bit, which is weird to say about a movie that has a massive green man in it. Exactly. So Thor's doing well on Rotten Tomatoes. People seem to like it, but uh, Paddington 2 is kicking its ass. Paddington 2 is currently sitting at a 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know what you even call that. There's that bear! There he is. There's that bear. Now, what's on his head, you ask? It's sandwiches. What kind of sandwiches? Marmalade you, sandwiches. Why, you, you don't up, not up in your pa Paddington lore. No, of uh, course, man. We always talk about Paddington, and I think people partially think we're we're being ironic and like and doing that thing where you like a thing that's stupid. But honestly, these are legitimately good movies. The first one is at a ninety eight percent, and that came out like two years ago. Yeah, so probably, like probably one of the best movies ever made. It's just it's a, to me. yeah, it's up there with like the Godfather Part Two. Yeah, but I think that's at, what they said. At any the, point in the Godfather Part Two, <laughs> does anybody flood an upstairs, and is that person a bear? No. No. Paddington does. He's great. Anyway. No, I uh, hair gets in. I'm not going to spoil it. I don't know. I feel, like, that yeah, I feel like these, these movies are seriously like underrated. They're just like weird and charming. Incredible. Well, like, like great special effects. Wonderful art direction. And like, I don't know. You can watch it with the whole family. In terms of this resurgence we've seen in like the last 10 or 15 years or so, uh, where uh, rich old psychopaths mine our childhoods 
for little gems and then exploit them and make terrible films out of them. Uh, Paddington's not one of them. Like, you look at those garbage-ass Smurf movies. Yeah. I'll say that. Like, who, are you really tracking those Smurf movies? They look terrible. Who cares? But I know Scott Bromley's in the chat right now being like, Katy Perry's in one of them. It's amazing. Yeah, I don't know. Like, we'll talk later, Scott. Uh, Paddington Bear, by no means, like, I loved that bear when I was a kid. He's great. If you had told me they're making a movie about Paddington Bear, when I first heard about it, I was like, well, you can't just leave it alone. Just leave the bear alone. Let him die in the UK or yeah. whatever that show. I think place. initially we were like, oh, this is going to be a terrible film. And then we went and saw it. We we're like, well, that's actually very touching. We enjoyed yeah. the bear films. Anyway, uh, on the subject of computer generated animal films, uh, one thing that just blew up online this week is the cast for The Lion King, yep. which I've seen some debate about whether or not this is a live action movie because all of the animals are, there's no actual people in it. It's just animals, but the animals are made out of computers, but they're probably filming some real animals. Just, Disney's calling it live action. Just, just, it's, let's just, for the sake of conversation, let's say it's a live action Lion King and not a CGI reboot, whatever. The cast going around is incredible. It's stunning. Um, this is such a great lineup. Uh, we knew about Donald Glover, I believe. Uh, I mean, Beyonce's playing Nala. Uh, James Earl Jones is reprising his role as Mufasa, which is really cool, uh, kind of tying it back to the original. Uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor, who's uh, in, uh, he's in, he's in Black Panther, right? Yeah. Um, or is he Doctor Strange? He's like the, buddy. Yes. yeah, he's in that, yeah. Um, so he's playing Scar, which is like, I, I know he's got like, he's got one of those like good badass voices. Jeremy Irons was the original Scar, but like this is going to be cool to see too. What I'm really excited about is Eric Andre is in this. Yeah. Uh, that rules. Um, I don't know that's if... That's great casting. That's like, he makes, I think, the only, like, the only talk show that's, like, worse than ours. Um, we mean that in nice <laughs> Yeah, way lovingly. Um, and also John Oliver Azazu is, like, one of, those, one of those casting choices where I'm like, oh, that completely, utterly, totally fits without any, like, I'm just, yes, that's it, good. Who is um, Azizi again? He's I think like, he's one of the like dumb baby lions. That, oh, like, with two different colored eyes? Something like that. Like he hangs out with, I don't know. There's According like a, to fan yeah. art I'm looking at right um, now. What I'm curious about is I, we saw this with the live action uh, Beauty and the Beast where they pulled a bunch of songs from the Broadway version and put them in there. And a lot of people were like, what the hell are these new songs? I grew up with the cartoon. And then it's like, no, no, these are from the, the play version. The Lion King obviously had like a hugely popular uh, Broadway show. So. Yes. Um, anyway, that's cool news. Uh, on I mean, the look, subject, I'm <laughs> that's awful. You, I, you, look, you just look like you have somebody just buzzed Seth Rogen just all over. Just went in there. They might do um, that. So on the subject of things that were really, really exciting in 1994, um, X-Men was one of them, along with Lion King. Uh, this week was actually the 25th anniversary of the premiere of the X-Men animated series on Fox Kids. The first episode, Night of the Sentinels, aired on, uh, on Fox at like on like Halloween, which seems like a really bad time to put up a cartoon for kids because they're all out dressed up as costumes. Right. Um, this was, you grew up with this, right? Oh God, I love yeah. this show. This was the original X-Men cartoon. This is, uh, I knew it was like cool when I was a kid. I hadn't seen anything like it, but I also was like, you know, I hadn't been around, I was like six or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of incredible to look back at it. The Hollywood Reporter put up this amazing article where they tracked down all of the cast and producers and crew and they kind of interviewed them and just got their different sides of the story of how this came together. I had no idea this show was as much of a train wreck to get made as it was. Um, basically, there was this one uh, producer at, at Fox Kids who had piloted a show called, uh, what is it? It's called The Pride of the X-Men, which, and the, the, it's floating around out there. It's really weird because I always thought this was the very first X-Men cartoon, but there was another one which was made in the late 80s and it had totally different X-Men designs. They were all based on kind of the earlier character designs, not like the 90s Jim Lee stuff. Um, but it like kind of sucked. Like it had much more of that like G.I. Joe, Real American Hero vibe to it. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I remember Dazzler that. was part of it. Uh, yeah. The kind of young X-Men role was, was filled by, by Kitty Pryde. Uh, <laughs> my favorite thing though is for no reason discernibly, uh, Wolverine has an Australian accent. Oh, I don't know. Really know how they were just like that works. That that makes sense. Sure. It's like, dude, he's like the whole Canadian thing is a you know big part of that. Um, I did like the fact that uh, there's the guys credits from YouTube. Um, I did like the fact that Dazzler and Nightcrawler were in there. They were some of my favorite characters. Um, but the the '90s X Men show. Uh, what's nuts about that is apparently one of the things that they had a hard time with doing with the show. It was serialized. Right. Uh, if you look at how those episodes are broken down, like I've I've done the thing where I'm like, oh, it's streaming. I'm gonna watch like one episode. And I'm like, oh, each season is an entire cohesive story. Yeah, arc. there were weird, there were weird story arcs in it that carried over. And when you were a kid, you basically had to watch every week because it became like mm -hmm. water cooler talk with your friends in exactly. school. Exactly. Um, like the whole uh, Jean Grey Cyclops relationship. 
Dude, had, that was had ups and downs, like an actual relationship, or so I thought. I was young. I hadn't had an actual relationship then. But yeah. like, you had to actually tune in every week to sort of keep along. And if you didn't, you'd come to school and you'd have to cover your ears and be like, spoilers. Which we didn't have to do with like Rescue Rangers. No. You know? um, what's really nuts is, yeah, uh, sick, man. I love that, Tootie Fruity, my favorite. Uh, the voice actors all were based out of Canada, which I think was some like weird contractual thing that was it was cheaper or whatever. Um, but this is all like kind of a precursor to, I, I don't know, they couldn't do anything digitally, so they'd have to record stuff on cassettes and like mail it back to L.A. where they're making the show. Uh, Haim Saban, who made Power Rangers, was a big part of producing this. It was just this weird kind of like cobbled together, jerry-rigged approach to making a cartoon. And the fact that it was serialized was a huge pain in the ass for them because if an episode wasn't finished, and oh, by the way, the episodes were all made in Korea, so they had to ship that stuff back and forth. Right. Which explains why occasionally... There are shots where Wolverine just doesn't have pants on, like they forgot to paint his legs. Oh, they put yeah, him in like yeah. a green, uh, like a blue speedo, and that's it. Or he um, forgot to put on his pants. Yeah, that does happen here and there. Um, but basically, it was like you know they're recording the voices in Canada, they're, they're making the cartoon in, in in Korea, and then in LA they're putting it together, and they're like, oh, what happens next week? Oh, that episode's not done yet. Ooh, so they pretty much had to have every season really on track before they were doing stuff. Wow. And that's like thinking back, I hadn't seen a cartoon that was like that. Occasionally, things would have like. Uh, you know, like two-parter episodes or three-parters, but you didn't really get these ongoing kind of like long serial arcs like you see in something like like an anime. Sure. Um, what's interesting too is that this also helped kind of establish uh, it established the X Men as a brand entirely, but it also helped establish like Fox Kids. Uh, they'd had Batman the Animated Series, which was their uh, weeknight show, uh, and that show wasn't as serialized, so they could they could kind of jump around with episodes. Yeah, they but did every, occasional two-parters yeah. on that show, but, but nothing like that. Every Saturday it was X Men. Yeah, um, and it's it's kind of nuts. Also, like Marvel wasn't doing so hot when this came out. Like this was kind of like a this was kind of a shot in the dark for them. Uh, the last success they'd had up before this was the '80s uh, Incredible Hulk cartoon or mm -hmm. uh, live action show. Uh, so like this kind of like weird roll of the dice that Fox Kids took established X Men as a as a brand helped elevate like Marvel and it got a ton of kids uh, like interested in comics. Uh, a lot of what I knew going into X Men uh, just introduced the characters and the and the kind of universe and the lore was from the cartoon because it does a really really good job of actually adapting some of the comic arcs. I think so um, specifically the reason there were so many butts in seats for the Brian Singer movies was because we grew up with this sort exactly, of yeah this kind of soft resurgence of X Men. Um, we talk about this a lot about the like the weird dark days of comic book fandom. But when I was a kid and I watched this every Saturday, I was huge into it. Me and my brother would stand up on the couch and just like sing along to the theme song, even though it didn't have lyrics. He'd be like, da -da 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 -da. Yeah. scare everyone. And my mom would be like, "What's going on in the other room? Are you guys okay?" You'd go to comic book conventions that were basically like there'd be an arcade in town or like something like that, and they'd build out the top floor. And on weekends after cartoons ended, you would ask your mom for a couple bucks. You'd get in a car and you'd go to this thing that was basically just like people selling. Use comics. There were guys who had Wizards, Wizard Magazine, which had all the price guides for everything in it. God. And you'd flip them open, and you'd get the old, um, the old '90s X-Men action figure toys. And you'd find weird ones, and they all had like weird, you know, protracting swords and stuff like that from their hands. Uh, it felt like old Star Wars collecting in a lot of ways. But that was kind of it. And then you got Marvel cards and little things like that. But there wasn't really any sort of like we didn't all come together in unison to watch the movies together. That wasn't until the 2000s with the Brian Singer X-Men movies when Fox got the license. So it. Felt really weird because you'd come into school and you'd see a kid with like a, like a shirt, with like, Magneto on it, and mm -hmm. you'd be like, I know who that is. So everyone Heathen, else is like, who's that? <laughs> Heathen Deluxe in our YouTube chat says, what are you talking about? Todd McFarlane's Spider Man was doing amazing at Marvel. I was there in 1992. Marvel was at a height, a height of its powers. Yeah, in in comic form. In comic but form. But also, yeah. Todd McFarlane uh, Spider Man apparently wasn't doing hot enough because 1991 is also when Todd McFarlane went and founded Image Comics because he wasn't really having a great time. Right. Uh, which with led to the Marvel. Spawn movie, which is a sort of a blight yeah. on comic book movies in history. Yeah. Like, I'm with you, man. I loved that era. And I think a lot of people are holding on to that era because it was very special. We got voices coming in. I don't know. Quiet down back there. Um, so uh, anyway, enough about X Men. X Men, the animated series, was a wonderful show. It's uh, it holds up sort of like you watch the Batman the animated series. That is a that is a legitimate good show. You can watch it as an adult and be like, wow, this is some good storytelling. Uh, the X Men show is <laughs> wonderfully corny. Like it's it feels like a high quality Thundercats almost. It, you know exactly. Like the voice acting is they're all so committed to what yeah. they're doing, and you're like, what are you like? It's like, yeah, uh, I mean, I know where X-Men is coming from, but like... You said the thing before about the uh, the late 80s uh, X-Men and how the Wolverine was Australian. Uh, Ninja DK in the Twitch chat says, they predicted Hugh Jackman being Wolverine. And yeah, I think that's really smart, you know? Roundabout like, thing. The idea of a, a, a... Do you... Side note, do you think anyone will ever be able to play that character again without being just... 
constantly chastised for not being Hugh Jackman. It's such a tough. Like I have you and I have major problems with those movies. Yeah, God Hugh Jackman's damn. so good. He's so good. Damn, I don't know that's how you, so good. Also, did you see he tweeted out on Halloween? He's like, well, I guess I'll finally put on the blue and yellow spandex, and he's like holding up like the '90s like or like do the, it the for crappy, a movie. The crappy rubies. It was God. like it was like a rubies costume, like the the cheapest one you can get. He's like, oh, I'll try this. I was like. Come Get out they of here. They don't even have one that he stole. I mean, yeah. even uh, Ryan Reynolds stole the Deadpool costume. Yeah, well, they didn't, that's they don't, Deadpool. Uh, they never made a blue and yellow one just for the movies that they didn't shoot. That bit, oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Did they? Yeah, it was in a deleted scene. A deleted scene? From the Wolverine. Our producer is uh, saying there's a deleted scene. Isn't it the end? They show it in the box. They don't show him wearing it. They just show it in the box. They're like, oh, here, want this costume? Just they, Unbelievable. Anyway, um, so... Love X-Men. The movies could be better. Apparently Thor Ragnarok's doing really well uh, yeah. and because it's a movie made in 2017 with superheroes in it, you better believe there are toys of it. Uh, Hasbro was cool enough to send over the latest kind of wave of Thor Ragnarok toys. Let's start with some of the Marvel Legends action figures. If you don't know Marvel Legends and you like toys or superheroes of the Marvel variety, you're missing out because these guys are great. This is probably the most consistent toy line that's been around. I was collecting these in high school. Uh, when X2 came in, into theaters, I went and saw it, and I was like, oh crap, that's right, I love Marvel Heroes, and I went to the store and bought a bunch of their, their figures. This toy um, is fantastic. So yeah, I love that cape. Whenever they do a movie line, I notice that the quality just spikes right up, I think because they're actually having to portray like real people. Um, we got a nice black series guy for scale. Get him out of here. That's not the right. That's not the right cannon. Uh, and then there is uh, there's Loki to go along with him. God, these are um, great toys. Awesome thing about this line is there's a lot of removable hats. Loki's little crown comes off. He looks a lot like Tommy Wiseau there, but that's also true of, of Tom Hiddleston in that in that hairpiece or whatever. Um, oh, wow, that's actually really good. Yeah, they're all yeah. like super poseable. Uh, and then we've also got this one is amazing. Uh, we've got Hela, um, who's got her like weird antlers, um, and she also has an interchangeable head. So you want to pose her looking a little bit more like evil Kate Blanchett, or you can Ooh, wow. just do this weird like you know totem pole effect. We just perch, double head perch that up there. Yeah, Mecca Shiva, Mecca Shiva. Anyway. Um, the cool thing, let's uh, let's go with this, the comic ones. They do this thing where they're mixed together movie movie stuff and uh, and comic book stuff. And here is the Odinson, which if you're reading Thor comics, I'm a little I'm not really up to date on what's going on exactly. But uh, Thor's kind of longtime ex girlfriend Jane Foster got a hold of Mjolnir and became like the new Thor. Um, this is a really nice figure. I like I like this one a lot. Yeah. Um, it's kind of cool to see like that those 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 funky little boots there, and um, you know you can pose the hell out of them. They're hard to balance. We got those these, hammers are awesome. We got these little stands at Amazon. Did he, yeah. he didn't come with one, huh? Uh, no, that's the whole that's the whole plot of Ragnarok because he doesn't have his hammer. Uh, and then there's then there's Ares here who I love because he pretty much just looks like a uh, medieval Punisher. Wow. Like he's just got like way Look too many weapons boots. and stuff. Yeah, those are funny great. funny like steel boots. Also check this out. His hat comes off. Oh hey. Look at that. Hey man. I don't know. A lot, of, a lot of removable hats here. Uh, and then if you get all these together, they all come with a piece, a leg, a chest, or a head, or whatever, of Hulk in his Damn. Gladiator costume, which is like a really just gorgeous, impressive toy. This thing is huge. That is a thing heavy is huge. figure. That's yeah. awesome. I mean, it's it's kind of, if you really just want Hulk, it's sort of a pain in the ass because you got to like drop like 120 bucks to get him. But it's, you know, it's it's gorgeous. And he's got this, this thing which just looks like an engine on a stick. Um, yeah, I was saying it looks like steampunk dental equipment. Yeah. Uh, these guys are 20 bucks a pop. You can get them wherever, you know, uh, Target, Walmart, CVS, Amazon, comic shop, whatever. Even Walgreens if you're there to um, get multivitamins or whatever. Exactly, yeah. You Pretend you're being an adult and then go to the toy aisle. Yeah, that's, that's a good trick. Do. I do that um, all the time. Now, in addition to these, they also sent over some more kind of kid, kid-oriented kid stuff that's for, um, you know, beating the crap out of your, your little brother. I don't have any, uh, you know, siblings, so but I do have Brian. So yeah. do you want to be Thor or Hulk? Um, am I going to take a beating or give one? I don't know. I haven't seen the film yet. Oh, okay. Well, let's, let's just beat the hell out of each other. Okay. Well, they have this. They have this. Well, uh, I'll take the fist. Why don't you put these guys on? They made this uh, this Hulk mask, which doesn't really fit too well on adult faces. How but does it, it turn on? It doesn't turn on. That's the weird thing. It's not electronic. It's just like stick your don't oh don't put your mouth put your on. mouth oh, in you're there? supposed to just put your face in there. Ah, oh, move God. your move your chin around if you can. Ah, uh, no, it, it hurts. We might have too big of faces for it. Uh, but if you're <laughs> If you're a little kid, ah! that's just, you just look like Frankenstein. This isn't this even. This is so painful. Look what it did right. in my ear. Here, why don't you put these hands on? That'll help. Ah, put, God. These, put the hands on. This hurts so much. Okay. Oh. All right. Now give me, give me your little hand. You you look like Leatherface. Ah! Jason. Come here, come here, come here. Give the me this. pain. Give me, give me hand. So these ones are, of course, it's crossing my nose. Electronic Hulk hands. So. We've had Hulk hands since the um, 
the 2003 Hulk, directed by Academy Award winner Ang Lee. You know, director oh my of, god, uh, it hurts my face! House of Sand and Fog and the Ice Storm. Um, <sighs> this is where the, the Hulk hands used to be way bigger. This feels... Hey, hey, you doing okay, big guy? Yeah, these are pretty small, actually. Uh, they're pretty small, and they're also... There's like... There's hard plastic there. Oh, so if man. you like... You're gonna break some if you this. backhand somebody with that... Luckily, you get the Hulk helmet to defend it. I, however, have Mjolnir, which I can use to defend myself. If, if you have one of those, like, those stupid microphones as a kid that you, like, sing into, it's the same technology, but this one's just for, like... Just a bunch of springs and crap in there. That's a horrible one. That sounds like someone threw a piano out a window. I think this could be good for cosplayers and stuff. That sounds like when Marv got hit in the with the iron in Home Pretty much. Uh, now, on the subject of things that make a bunch of noise... I'm a businessman, typing my emails, sending some work emails, cause I'm Hulk and I'm going to work, I'm gonna type all day and I'm... Hey. Work sorry. Hulk. Work Hulk. Alright. You take that thing off your face now, you hear me? It's actually stuck. <laughs> oh crap, look at that. It really, from the back, uh, you, you really do look like Jason Voorhees. I don't uh, like it. Just not worried about that, those straps on the, on the bald man's head. Hey, if you have a small face, you're gonna love that mask. Yeah, that's the weird thing is, after the Hulk hands have been idle for a while, mm -hmm. there's this weird noise of, of Hulk being like, yawning, and I guess he's supposed to be going to sleep. Okay, that's not, that's not what the movie's about. That's not what they do in there. That yeah, is. Take that off of there. That's what they do. Of course, his hat. Is his hat stuck in there? What hat? He stole his hat. <laughs> anyway, so they also have these big, goofy talking ones. Um, the whole big thing, thing with toys this is cool. here is toys that talk to each other because I, I guess, I don't know, like the uh, Angry Birds destroyed the imaginations everywhere or something, but pretty much we used to be like, I'm Thor, I'm gonna beat you up, or I'm the Hulk. And now you don't even have to talk or, like, you know, think about it. What? They'll just talk to each other. This is Earth. Yeah. Love that quote. From yeah, Hulk. classic line. Uh, yeah. So anyway, um, there's like little sensors and they, they, they'll interact here and there. Um, but these guys are like, I don't know, if you're, if you're six years old or you just want something cool to put on your desk, you're not going to pose too much. Uh, Thor is 25 and Hulk is 35. I really actually do like the Hulk. How does he, like, does he talk? Push that button again. Oh, wow. Yeah. They are no match for Hulk. Yeah. You could, man, a lot of these things are designed specifically to hurt. Check this out. Anyway, those are some scary sounds coming from toys, but we have some crazy news here. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, we have an exclusive partnership with the International Space Station, and we have some IGN correspondents working up there in space right now. Going to special guest Alana Pierce, our in-house space journalist. She's up there at the ISS. Alana, how you doing up there? Yeah, good thanks, Max. Coming to you live from the International Space Station and definitely not just a part of uh, the IGN office. And we've got some exciting stuff for you today. For Halloween, uh, we put together a playlist of spooky space sounds because, of course, as you guys know as other science experts, uh, most spacecrafts have technology that allow them to capture basically radio magnetic waves, which then can be turned into sound waves. So no, hold on, a, hold on a second. I know that? that in space, no one can hear you scream. What can they hear you doing? So technically, these aren't actual audio waves. These are electromagnetic waves. Uh, it's like radiation, which is then transferred into an audio wave so that basically the actual scientists can analyze the data better. It's like getting a physical or sensory sound that lets them hear the way the radiation would sound if it had so a sound. Recorded radiation? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what right. it is. Well, what the hell does radiation sound like? All right, I've got a couple of examples for you here. First, we're going to play uh, Juno crossing Jupiter's bow shock. Love that song. Oh man, that's all like, right, well, I don't like that. That just noise sounds like all. It didn't sound like anything that. like that. It's like that. the same noise. Who, what, what, why did would you, they make what did you guys think noise? of that? That's no, it's bad. It's not a good noise but at all. You didn't all. like it. No, no. I would give that noise a D. That's a bad song. Oh. I would well, not that, buy that song. I wasn't song expecting on iTunes. that. Well, that's is basically that, the sound of a solar wind. Uh, that is the Juno spacecraft crossing the boundary of Jupiter's magnetic field. So what you're hearing there is basically a bunch of particles smashing onto each other and creating creepy sounds. Uh, or creating a lot of 
radio waves, which are then transferred into sound. So that's that's the first one. Are they yeah. hoping that's going to actually get some radio play? Because I, I think it needs more work. I think you should head back to the studio and do a couple more passes on that track. Well, I mean, you realize we just played it live, right? Well, what? no. What other noises are up in space? The next one that I wanted to play for you guys is uh, chorus radio waves. This one's pretty cool. That's a freaking slide whistle. That's not. Sp I don't think this is real. I think you're. I think those. Effing Martians up there making the funny sounds. So they. They recorded a bunch of ra radiation and. <laughs> How long is this song? This is like. Uh, it actually, that one's actually pretty long. So if you had to guess what planet that was from, what would you guess? Uranus. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, do you just make a butt joke? No, it's my favorite planet. <laughs> wow, Brian, that one's from Earth, okay? That one's from Earth, so what you're hearing there is basically... That doesn't count. Earth's outer atmosphere has lots of magnetic fields, and the way they sound depends on the density of the particles, so kind of like right around Earth, they're a lot colder and denser, so they would sound super different. This is a little bit further out, and what we're hearing is effectively these particles smashing together like the ocean. It's like an ocean roar. It's like they're just crazy beating the crap out of each other, and that's exactly what that sound is. Hey, Alana, if you like sounds from Earth, you'll love music. <laughs> music is overrated, Brian. Why would you listen to that when you can listen to the sounds of space? <laughs> so next we have uh, Cassini putting a shield on. I like this one a lot. Big a fan. A shield? Mm-hmm. All right. It's like a prog rock thing. Get it out of here. Ah, oh. God. I don't like this. I don't like these new these new millennial genres. I don't get it. This... Well, what planet did that come from? Oh, it's got vocals. Get it. Stop. <laughs> stop. Nah. Is that, is, that, is that the moon? How does it stop? How does it stop? How does the sound not do the sound? Is that, is that the sound of the moon cheese being scraped? <laughs> no, it's definitely not the moon cheese being scraped, Brian. Actually, that is what it would sound like if you were to go through one of Jupiter's rings. Uh, that's basically a hailstorm. And the Cassini spacecraft actually was one of the most ambitious space projects ever, where they sent it out into space to capture a bunch of stuff about Jupiter so that we knew more about that area. And they went through one of Jupiter's rings. That's basically the hailstorm of a million dust particles hitting the spacecraft at the same time. That's why there's also audio there, because this is an actual ship. It wasn't manned, but it's an actual spacecraft. And that's, uh, it put its shield up so that Jupiter wouldn't completely destroy it. And that's what it sounds like to hang out in Jupiter's rings. Wow. Are you telling me you can't walk on those rings? Uh, you would be torn apart almost immediately. So you could theoretically use the, the planet as a large saw to cut through other stuff in space, right? Uh, you, I mean, it would implode, just immediately be torn to pieces. Yeah. Who put so. the ring there? Is, there? is Jupiter married? Uh, no, that was actually our great lord Sauron. Um, yeah, he put that there, the one ring to rule them all. So. That dinosaur guy Sauron from the went to space? You guys didn't know this? No. Wow, well, that's why you need a scientist on this show, huh? Well, too bad our scientist is in space. Alana, thank you for joining us from the International Space Station that is definitely not the IGN Studios. Also, thank you I so love much. that your, your gravity boots are doing great. Keep it yeah. up. Yeah, we really figured that tech out. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for playing those dreadful noises for our ears. Move over, Skrillex. There's something parents are going to hate even more than you. <laughs> you can create those at home with a fax machine and some water. All right, so. <laughs> Machine in water. <laughs> this, man, I don't ever want to hear space again. Yeah, I, I'm some, very happy a lot really, brought us those noises. Yeah. I didn't, is that what it sounds like out there? I don't want to go there ever again. All right, so on the subject of awful things to come from space, um, there's a new Predator movie coming out soon. It comes out August 3rd, 2018. Uh, we don't know a ton about it. We know it's written and directed by Shane Black, who did a bunch of Lethal Weapon movies and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and was also in the original Predator. He's the guy who makes the really bad jokes... Like, he makes the really dirty jokes that I can't actually repeat on this show. Uh, anyway, uh, he's working on the movie, and it's got a bunch of people. It's got uh, Keegan-Michael Key in it, and it's got uh, Thomas Jane, Olivia Munn. Uh, we don't know what the premise is. It's Predator. We know there's going to be, like, invisible aliens showing up and shooting lasers and stuff. Mm -hmm. However, Thomas Jane spoke to a podcast called Shadow Nation, which is hosted by Ghost Man and the Demon Hunter, who are a pair of paranormal investigators who also cover movies. Why don't we have cool names like that? 
we can make up sick nicknames after this. Just gotta, gotta, I don't know, go hang out behind the metal shop or something. Um, Tall boy in the bowling ball. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it locked, everybody. Um, but yeah, Thomas Jane uh, gave some insight onto what this movie is about exactly, and this is just verbatim his quote, a little bit of censorship, but I figured just pretend you're hearing it from him. We play these veterans from like Afghanistan or the Iraq war or whatever, but we're all effing crazy. So we go to the VA hospital, get our meds. We're all like shell-shocked PTSD soldiers. We're at the VA hospital. We're all group therapy. And of course, somebody flips out. This is backstory. I don't think we really see this. Somebody flips out. We all get arrested and get thrown onto the bus. And they go down to the hospital and they throw this other guy on the bus too. And he's a guy they've actually marked to kill him because he's seen a UFO. He's down the Predator ships. Uh, he's, they come down, so they lock him up, and they throw him in with us lunatics. They're going to take that bus. They're going to drive it down to a ditch. They're going to shoot us all to get rid of this one guy. But, of course, we take that bus over, and we're all like, F that, man. Let's go kill these effing Predators ourselves. And we're just crazy enough to believe this guy really did see a UFO. And then and there's these aliens out there. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, uh, yeah, Thomas Jane. Uh, if you Google image search Thomas Jane, you'll find photographs of him at San Diego Comic-Con doing interviews for, I believe, The Expanse. Notable thing about these photos, just him wearing clothes and stuff, he's not wearing shoes. It's sort of unusual. I don't know if you've been to Comic-Con. Most people there wear shoes. Yeah, the floor um, is covered in gra uh, glass. You really should. Yeah, they do. They, they, promotional there. glass. So did he just Thomas Jane's plane the, impl the plot of that entire Yeah, movie? he totally let the cat out of the bag. Like, normally they have, like, a whole marketing team. They're like, all right, we're going to fine-tune this and really give it a... He's like, they're from the Iraq War or Afghanistan or whatever. It's like... Mm, what? Oh, all right, right. Fair, fair enough. Um, I, I really do like Thomas Jane. He's Me like too. A, he's a weird dude. I remember the whole thing was he was like, he's like, I'm playing the Punisher. And they're like, uh, yeah. And he's like, so do I get to, like, become a Navy SEAL? And they're like... You don't have to, and he's like, I want to. And he like went through this whole like insane training regiment to like actually get in character for that. Uh, his character in Boogie Nights is like one of my favorites. Uh, he's just an interesting dude. So like I'm excited to see what the hell he's doing with the Predator. Uh, yeah. I like his description of the Predator, especially when he says it's kind of cool. Yeah, that's a good part. That was a weird way to find out about the plot yeah, of that movie. That doesn't usually happen in, in 20... It's like, oh yes, on this uh, Paranormal Investigator podcast, Thomas Jane like just let... Just release the whole... Blurb about the Predator. We literally have like a teaser poster and a cast. That's, That's pretty it. much it. So, yeah, we don't know anything else. Uh, anyway, I'm excited to find out more. Uh, Shane Black is an awesome writer and director. And yeah. the fact that he actually has ties going back to Predator. And like, I mean, he's explored yeah. like yeah. this whole kind of PTSD angle in uh, Iron Man 3 and in Lethal Weapon. So I think it's kind of like in his wheelhouse. Plus, it's a freaking Predator movie. Like, how, how stupid could it be? Yeah, I'm totally into that. I think um, if you, you saw The Nice Guys, which you should have, because it was one of, uh, what, last year's oh, best yeah, movies? Oh, yeah, that was my favorites, yeah. Um, there were some really interesting parts in that movie that made me realize that that guy will make a great Predator movie, in that they were just, it's a it's sort of a slapsticky comedy buddy cop movie. But uh, there's also just random bouts of extreme violence that are never addressed by anyone. Like, a guy gets shot, like, off screen, and there's just blood explodes everywhere, and they're never like, we gotta check on that guy. It just happens, and I'm like, okay. Well, if, like, that blatant disregard for human life gets thrown around in that film, I'm totally down. Yeah. Even, like, the worst Predator movies, I'm not counting Alien vs. Predator, but sort of, like, Predators kind of falls apart by the end. Mm -hmm. But I just, I love, I love the build-up in that movie. Oh, I love yeah. the first half of that movie, I'd say. I mean, the big secret with Alien compared to Predator, not versus, but, I mean, Alien starts out, it's Ridley Scott, it's, like, super kind of, like, almost, like, it's, like, film school, just, it's textbook awesome film. First Predator movie... I mean, it's John McTiernan. It's like a goofy ass action movie about muscle men in the jungle. Like it's, right. it's there's like they they come from a very different source. So like when people are like Predator Two sucks compared to Ali compared to Aliens, sure. And then you look at like Predators always had like one foot in like the campy kind of '80s B movie thing, whereas Aliens like that used to be like super hard good sci-fi. And anyway, so I'm excited to see. Um, Silly times with the Predator and some violence. I agree. Uh, I travel a lot. You do too as well. Um, Nintendo Switch has been phenomenal. You're probably playing Mario. I don't blame you. There are hundreds, literally hundreds of moons to get in that game. Um, but if you're like me, uh, you play a bunch of games at the same time and you probably need a palate cleanser here and there. So I realized, uh, because we don't necessarily always have a catch-all for these things here at IGN, and also because I really love indie games and the Switch is becoming such a great home for them, that there are a bunch of really cool indie games that ha hit on Switch recently, like very recently, that you probably totally missed. And that's okay because I just checked, uh, the Switch turned six months old and it just had its like 210th game. 
launched on the system already, which is pretty also, nuts if you think about it. Like, side note, if you're just on the fence about the Nintendo Switch, like, the train has left the station, yeah. it's good to go. It's, it's good. fine. Yeah. You're, you can buy in now, EA. <laughs> uh, no. So anyway, uh, I thought I'd run down some of the games I'm playing that I really like that launched in the last couple of weeks or months. Uh, Really cool little things. Look up the trailers for them. We'll show you some footage right here. Uh, starting with Splasher, which just launched. When I first heard about this game, it looked sort of like a 2D Splatoon meets Meat Boy. I'm not entirely wrong about that, but it's really fun and it's very twitchy, like quick hitting based platforming game. Uh, it uses paint as a sort of mechanic. Uh, blue can lift you up. Red is something you can run along hmm. and yellow will make you bounce. So. Uh, switching between those things is not always entirely your choice. The environment actually throws things at you. Um, but it really punishes you and rewards you for playing well and getting through levels quickly. I'm sort of taking it at my own pace and sort of unlocking levels as they go. But it's really fun. It's a nice little surprise. It's really cartoony. It feels like something from sort of like late 90s, early 2000s era Nickelodeon. Um, and I dig it. There's a ton of challenges, a ton of levels to unlock and play. And it's really a special thing. Uh, in terms of 2D platforming games on the Switch, you'd be surprised there actually aren't that many of them. There should be tons, because it's sort of a perfect platform for it, for it, no pun intended, but it's just not there yet. But that's one of the ones that's early on in the first six months of the, of the system. Just launched, it's $14.99, so check it out. If you have $3 and you want to spend $3 on a really cool game that'll cost you less than a coffee, a game just launched called Night Terrors. Uh, it's sort of an endless runner, but you play as, I know you're getting worried, I said endless runner, That's those are bitter words. But Night Terrors is sort of this weird 90s throwback 16-bit uh, game starring this knight that's blue who isn't named Shovel Knight. This looks like a blacklight poster. I yeah, it. it's really cool. So it's three bucks, and the more you play, the higher score you get. You actually unlock different modes and different sub-weapons, so it sort of has this kind of like roguelike element to it. Uh, this was designed by Nicholas, who worked on a couple other games on Switch. One of them, they've been porting Cave Story for years. Uh, they do really cool stuff with physical copies of games, this one will probably never get one because it's so cheap. But seriously, it's three bucks. The Switch is perfect for sort of like pick up and play, quick arcade skill-based games like this. I want to see more of them. I don't want to play a game like that on my phone. I want to play it on Switch, so I'm glad it's there. Uh, coming up next is Wolverblade, a game I really want to do a Let's Play with Max about. Maybe we'll do that next week. Uh, this is a side-scrolling beat-em-up that feels like one of the most violent cartoon games I've ever played. But it's also historically accurate. Oh, good. So uh, a lot of the environments here were based on real battles, um, which sounds like when, you know, Kaz Harai described Genji 2 at that famous yeah. Sony press conference. Oh. But the art style is gorgeous, super violent. Uh, when you're Look at that. You rip off somebody's head, you can actually pick up their head and throw it. I don't know how historically accurate that was. Uh, but it'll actually, like, show you a battle uh, in a level, and then you'll beat it, and afterwards there's, like, drone footage of where that place and that battle That's actually That's really took place. cool. It's really clever. Uh, it's got co-op, a um, couple players like can play at the same time. a Castle Crasher vibe to it. Totally. Um, very, very difficult. Like, really hard game. It kind of pushes back a little more than I'd hoped. I hope they patch an easy mode into it. Um, but it's really cool. This is just, like, made by a very small team of passionate people. They worked on it for five years. Uh, and it's called Wolverblade. Um, and it's out now. It's 20 bucks. So go check that out. Um, we talked about action platformings. We talked about Nicholas. One of the other games they make is called Tiny Barbarian. This one's 30 bucks, a little pricier than I would have kind of hoped, but the physical packaging for it's really awesome. This is very old school, ghouls and ghosts, Karnov, almost like a little bit of sort of action platformer vibe to it here. Um, oh, that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is actually, yeah, there it is. So this is the actual gameplay. Um, and All just right. a real buff dude just really feeling that burn. So 16-bit art style, uh, it feels like something from a very long lost era from the 90s, something you would have rented back in the day. Um, yeah, awesome gotta, boss fights. Uh, the cool thing about this game is that it doesn't have lives. You gotta get creative when you're making a, a trailer yeah, that's for like how you do it. game. Uh, so you get through sections of the level and then you never have to play them again. Uh, you just move on to the next thing. So you won't have to worry about game overs and stuff like that. But each sort of screen is very difficult. Uh, we focus on a lot of sort of like side-scrolling platform stuff. I wanted to focus on one that is a little different. This game's called Implosion. It's top-down. It's $11.99 and uh, it's a port of a mobile game. Again, scary words, but this one has no Michael tra transaction nonsense. Good, I hate Michael transaction. Michael transaction. <laughs> uh, and it's got like none of that, just like you just buy it for 12 bucks and you own all the content. Um, 
This is a top-down sort of three-fourths angle. Hopefully you have some footage. There it is. Look at that donk. I love this movie. <laughs> uh, and so this is an action plat uh, sort of an action game, not really platforming. Uh, you're a, like a robot ninja, and you uh, upgrade your character, get him better swords, get him better suits, just beat the hell out of waves of enemies, and um, it's level-based, and there's huge bosses and all this other cool stuff. So I really dig that. That wasn't gameplay right there. No, right? it wasn't. That was, That's okay. just, yeah. yeah. So I honestly, this was a tough list to put together. I could have put 20 games on this list. I'll probably do sequels to this video. Um, but yeah, that's just five cool games I'm playing right now. How many How many games do you have in your Switch library right now? I think I have 105. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, there's a lot. That's a lot, yeah. Uh, I mean, like, you know, in the interest of honesty, I get a lot of games through IGN. I get sent a lot of codes. I buy a lot myself, too. I just try to stay well-versed on this stuff. I, um, but I, I do it really because I, you know, I love playing games on this thing, and a lot of the games are sort of small and succinct, and you can sink two or three hours into them and just and finish them, and yeah. that's pretty awesome. So. No, I mean, I... I'm I kind of skipped like the last generation of Nintendo hardware, which is kind of saying a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, I screwed around on Wii a bunch, but I never really fully uh, got into 3DS, and I never really got a Wii U. Uh, so I'm kind of like out of the loop on what how Nintendo is to, to customers lately. Uh, it's my birthday this Saturday, and I got an email last night from Nintendo where they're like, "Hey, happy birthday! Here's 30% off one game." And I was like, "You, s you, got, you got, get a thing? You keep, and they could have been like, hey, here's a free game. And I would be like, oh my god, that's incredible. Isn't the that fact, sweet? The fact feels... they were just like, here's a coupon. Like, dude, I never got that from like Xbox or PlayStation. They were never like, hey. It hey, feels like, um, thanks, man. It feels like what Burger King used to do. They'd be like, it's your birthday. Yeah. Here's a Burger King Kids Club and a free cheeseburger. Come yeah. on in. I mean, if I was like 12 years old and I really wanted, you know, Super Mario Odyssey and I didn't have uh, 60 bucks, but I got like 40 bucks for my. Is that 30%? That's not 30%. I don't know how to math. Yeah. Works. But like, that's still like a good chunk of the game would be like, oh, cool. And then I could go buy a action figure or whatever. Yeah, I uh, really like what they're doing right now. Um, I think there's something that... I'm, this is a weird thing to say, but I think that like when a company does really well and then doesn't do so well, there's this sort of generosity and humility that comes from the place of them being like, well, we don't want to hit that point again. And the Wii U was cool. Like, I actually liked a lot of the games on it. I co-hosted NVC for years during what we called the Dark Ages because week to week there wasn't really a lot to talk about. Um, most of the best games are getting ported to Switch, uh, which is really awesome if you missed that generation, which millions of you did. Um, there's an opportunity to play them now. But like, I think there's something that is sort of great about that. We're seeing it with Sony right now. Like The PS3 sort of had its upside and downs after the PS2 was so dominant, and the PS4 is great. Um, it's a good time to play video games. Yeah. Uh, we try to take the show to celebrate the things we love in the world. Maybe the things you missed. Um, cool toys, awesome video games. Just really, yeah. just this is a, this is a, a labor of passion. We and try I hope you enjoy to it. be positive we here. We really do. But sometimes but we have to be realistic. We have to we have to talk about something. There is a perpetrator of some very bad things out there. There is a war against the best circle. He's a, his name is uh, Charles Entertainment Cheese. Maybe you've heard of you him. You may no, know him better Chuck. as Chuck E. Cheese. That is literally his full name. You can look it up. Uh, anyway, Charles is at it again. He's yep. uh, he's uh, it's already you shouldn't trust a rat to make your pizza for you. Uh, he's kind of overstepped some boundaries. Just for context, if this is your first time on Earth, here's what a pizza looks like. That's a pizza, right? Not even a great one, but that's one it's for sure. It's a picture of a pizza. You know, you have phone that at your screen. That's just it. You'd have that, you know, at two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday yeah. night. Yeah. Now Charles has decided to unveil a great new product that he calls a pizza. Charles has some ideas. That's what. It is, and it's, he's calling it a pizza. Brian, could you give us some insight on what this is attempting to do? Can I speak through pure rage at a cartoon animal? Uh, yes, I can. This is a threat. <laughs> this is an absolute threat on everything that we love about what we think a pizza should be because we know what a pizza is. This, my friends, is a mess. Sometimes... Well, can we, first of all, let's break this down. Those sometimes are, things can be one thing, and sometimes things can be several things, and sometimes those things don't need to be shoved together. Let's take a look at what this is. Yes, first of all, oh. we have this Captain America shield of bread that we don't understand. We don't know where it came from. It's a Frisbee of dough that has been baked until it's harder than a sarcophagus. Atop that, we believe to see one of the two living worms that fester on this circle, to be mac and cheese. Why? Cheese goes on pizza, right? So why not mac and cheese? But dare that rat stop then? No, he shall not. Because atop that, he added Cheetos. 
from Chester Cheetah. A different animal drawing. <laughs> I don't like what they're doing here. Also, the, the mac and cheese has the dinosaur, and then this has like a cheetah and the rat all working together. This yeah. is like some like disgusting totem pole of carbohydrates. Exactly. You know, like It's Rescue Rangers villains teaming again, up against pizza. Here's pizza. Doesn't yep. matter if it's good or bad. This is the structure of pizza. You've got the round, flat, doughy thing, and it's yep. got sauce and cheese on top of that, and then some other crap on top of it. You the might cheese. notice a color in there called red. Yes. What does that indicate? There's no red here. What's here? So what is this? This is driving me crazy because we keep seeing where it's like, oh, it's Mrs. Fields cookie pizza. And you're like, it's not a pizza. It's just a big cookie. And this, like, just because something is round and you can eat it and you have to cut it first doesn't make it pizza. Can I tell you? Can, can we go back to that picture again? This horrid image, this cursed image here. Can I tell you what's the scariest thing about this picture? Let's take a look. That pizza slice is floating away by itself. <laughs> How do we know that the rat? No is one is lifting that. There is no. There's no hand. There is oh, no. Wait, hold on. No, you there's, can, there's a spatula there. No, it's not. You can kind of see the spatula. Nope. On the that's a there. ghost. No, there's like a small spatula. It's a ghost slice. It's escaping. There could be a ghost under the spatula. I don't know how they did the pizza. So while the robot animals sing songs to you, and your dad gets hit in the head with a skee ball in the other room, you can dine on this wonderful treat of cartoon worms and animals working in synchronicity to attack your inner stomach lining. So anyway, don't go to Chuck E. Cheese to eat that. Don't also, do that. Also, you legally aren't supposed to if you're an adult, unless you have kids with you. So don't do that, because it's uncomfortable when they tell you to go home. Yeah, we can't even do a video on that. We'll get thrown out at the yeah, door. Yeah, they're like, please go away. You know what we'll have like, to do? We have to go and like, rent kids or whatever. I'll bring this guy in. Works. I'll be like, my son with a mustache. And then they call like the... Ultra, the super cops, yep. the really the big, the, the bigger cops, ones, yeah, biggest cops. Anyway, um, yeah, again, we don't, we don't like to get too negative on this show. No, nope. nope. we like we, this positive so let's, show. Let's get back to some positive stuff. Let's yeah. talk about stuff we love. Yeah, Star Wars. We love, love Star, Star Wars. Wars. Yeah, big fan. The Last Jedi just oh. around the corner. It's gonna be great. I'm really looking forward to it. Obviously, there's lots of cool toys out there. There's action figures. Remember Yoda. There's yeah, Yoda. Great frog. It, he, we don't know if he's in it. He probably isn't in it. But Star Wars is gonna be great. It's gonna be awesome. So we're getting all these Big new fan. these new products. They're, they're gonna be putting on like cereal and love that Star Wars snacks nice. and stuff. I got an email from uh, the Build a Bear Workshop. Don't love ask, it. Love bears. Don't, don't ask me why I get their emails. I don't know. They're making some Last Jedi Build a Bears, and I think they've gone a bit far. Let's take a look at what these things are. Here they are. Oh! It's the, it's the Last Jedi's Build-A-Bears. Look, the Praetorian Guards on the far left there, those are, that's a fine costume. We've got an action figure of one here. He's pretty cool looking. You might notice that he's got a large, like, scimitar, like, halberd type blade, this, this interesting glaive, this bladed weapon that you would use to maim and kill. That's cool. It's Star Wars. It's a, it's a, it's a movie about war in the stars. I don't know why the bear is wearing this awful patent leather S&M apron and having this disgusting welding shield. It just looks, <laughs> it just looks like the, it just looks like, just, just really, it, I, don't, I don't like it one bit. And then conversely, you've got Captain Phasma here as a bear. You know, Captain Phasma, the, the chrome armor, a bunch of metal, a bunch of just things. Maybe Captain Phasma just doesn't translate to a bear. What's Maybe, up with that, uh, what's up, it looks like the underwears. What's up with that thigh gap? I don't like that at all. I don't like what's happening there. I don't like the weird beady eyes. I don't like the it's, salute. Can you imagine if Captain Phasma's armor was just like her body, her just parts? It's just upsetting and it's weird. And then on the same on the same note, then they've got Chewbacca here, who you think should have been the easiest one. How do you screw that up? He's a I, bear already. I know that they both have style guides. I know there's a Star Wars style guide and a Build a Bear style guide, but maybe. Maybe the fact that you've also got a porg over here that completely adheres to what a porg looks like. Maybe just make Chewbacca as a stuffed animal. Maybe you don't need to make the Build-A-Bear version of Chewbacca. Maybe just make Chewbacca. The, the stuffed Why does animal. that porg look like it has Mozart's hair? It's very awful. And we've seen some very awful porgs already. Anyway. So he's wearing, he's wearing uh, nail polish. <laughs> it's really just not great. And you have to go to the store and you put the you put the weird skins on that tube full of the foam and it shoots it into the animals. It's like a So my I would like to say this to Build a Bear. Just just take it easy. Just yeah. maybe or just stop completely. It's fine if you're doing the bears. It's great if you go there, you I don't know, your grandma wants to buy you a bear. You put like a leather jacket on it and sunglasses. That's cool. It's still a bear. Just maybe if you're not sure what you're doing with Star Wars, just take it easy. Just Calm down. That is the like the Cheetos mac and cheese pizza of pork. Get that out of here! Oh, it is I, Mozart. Get it out of here! <laughs>
Are we gonna find out that they all have like they all have flowing locks and Luke's been up there shaving them on Octo on that island? Just like, oh yeah, these birds are too hairy. I've got to cut their hair for them. You know, I wish we should we should we should take those bears and try to figure out the plot of that movie. I don't think that's a good idea. I still oh, want to see the film. Look at the pork. Get it out of here! It's not <laughs> bad. No, it's not good at all. I actually like Thank that. Thank you. I like a good pork with a man's body. <laughs> Bosk is a Trandoshan, not a pork. All right, so um. We want to talk about Super Mario Odyssey? Yeah, let's get back to the good stuff. Yeah, so I, we're, we're, we're kidding. Build-A-Bear, you're okay. Chuck no, you, and Cheese, you, you're, you're, on, you're on thin ice. Um, we're old men. What do we know? Somebody in the comments was like, Max, I saw you eat uh, Mountain Dew and, and Doritos out of a cereal bowl. That was like, out of spite. Yeah. <laughs> that was out of why spite. Would they, why would they take information from you, you know? Yeah. I've eat, I, ate a, I, ate a, I ate a Burger King. It was, it was like a Big Mac and a Whopper fused together. I had a black cheeseburger in Japan. They made my mouth purple. Like, don't listen to us. We don't know what we're doing. Look at us. Look at this. Yeah, like, what? how would you ever take this seriously? We you're look like, like... These guys are a joke. Yeah. We look like undercover yeah. cops. Don't, yeah. don't listen to us. <laughs> hey, kids. You know any cool places that your friends are doing stuff that's illegal? Do you? We look like a direct-to-video sequel to Home Alone. Like, we look like the, the bad guys in a movie like that. Like, his name's, like, Boss, and I'm, I'm Harold or whatever, or, like, Burvy. Look yeah. at us. Don't listen to us. Yeah. Anyway, we're both playing Super Mario Odyssey. Uh, there's going to be a, a bloodbath at the end of the year about what game of the year is for a number of reasons. Um, I'm having, personally, a very tough decision teetering between Zelda and Mario in terms of which one I love best. Because I think both of them not only encapsulate what I've always loved about those games before, but also are taking them in kind of interesting and really smart and really clever new directions after, I would say, kind of a decade or so of slight fatigue, right? If you look at the Mario games, the 2D ones played it safe for a very long time. Then we got the new Super Mario resurgence in the late 2000s. We sort of took it in a different direction, uh, but then we got like four or five of those. Some of that stuff was influenced into Mario Maker, uh, but we didn't really get a dedicated 3D platforming Mario game kind of since Sunshine. We got Mario 64, Sunshine, and then two Galaxy games, which were kind of more like bite-sized levels. This feels very, very different. Now, the game's been out for a week tonight. Uh, you and I have both sunk significant time into it. Uh, how, many, how many moons do you have? 620. I have 84. Yeah, I got the game the same time all of you did, by the way. I yeah. didn't get a copy. We played a copy early here at work, so I got a little bit of a heads up, but I, I started a new save file Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific time like everybody else did. I'm just crazy, and I just, had, I just needed to do that. Yeah. Do that. I, just, I needed to do oh, this. You've always been a Mario guy. Uh, what I like about it is that and I understand this isn't, you know, for everybody. I like that it does kind of modernize Mario. Yeah. Uh, there's parts in here where it just feels like very, very low pressure. Like it's kind of just like you kind of just go poke around, have fun, just do your thing. Uh, New Dong City, once you kind of like get past, the, you like, first of all, you, you like become a tank and you shoot bullets and stuff, which is sort of like a weird, like I remember when they were like, Mario just, he just jumps, that's what he does. Yep. And this one they're like, nah, he does all kinds of crap. Uh, but like New Dong City, once you're you're just running around, it's it feels like a playground. It feels like a virtual playground. You were saying something which I thought was really smart in that New Dong New Dong City doesn't really have enemies in it when you when you go back to it after doing the sort of main objective yeah. stuff, which is really cool because no, it's it, like yeah. it's like walking around Times Square in GTA doesn't have enemies. Right, you can you, make them. Yeah. You can't you make know? your enemies in, in New Dong City, which I think is kind of funny because everyone's just terrified of this weird overalls like gnome who's just running around throwing his hat at stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean it's 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 a cool place. It gives you areas where you can basically practice your you know practice your moves because it is all about like how you how you traverse the area. Uh, and it's it's nice to just be like I just, you just want to screw around and just practice jumping and just yeah. Make I th go wahoo. I think what the game does best is it sort of um, and I think a lot of people won't like this, but it's not as handholdy as some of the other three D Mario's. It doesn't specifically say like go to do this. Um, it kind of leaves you to your own creative decisions, which I think makes finding stuff almost that much more rewarding. Uh, there were some hidden stars in Mario 64, like you'd find a toad in the basement of Peach's castle, and he'd be like, oh, you found me, here's a star. This feels like an entire game based on that. You know, just like the sort of hidden stuff that was in the margins in the old Mario games is now its own thing here. Yeah. I think it's really smart. I heard um, it like referred to as being dense, and I think that's exactly what it is. It's not like, you look at something like, uh, like Breath of the Wild was huge. Breath of the yes. Wild was, was just massive and sprawling, and uh, I mean, that was, that was a wonderful world to explore, and they gave you a great toolkit to do that. But I like the idea that Mario is like a little bit more compact, and it's more about just 
playing around with the area around you and just and, and screwing with it. It also, like, you look at what Breath of the Wild did and it, it really completely threw the Zelda formula out the window. Yeah. Like, they rebuilt that whole thing from the ground up. They borrowed little bits from, like, uh, from uh, Skyrim, from, like, yeah. uh, from Far Cry. Like, just taking a look at what other games are like in 2017 and really just retooling the whole, the whole formula. Uh, Odyssey feels like they... Retooled some of it. Yeah. You know, it's not a complete overhaul. It's still Mario jumping, but they gave him some kind of new tricks to I know. think by the time Breath of the Wild came out, we were on our, you know, fourth or fifth 3D Zelda in a row that started to feel a little samey. And um, we did lose some things in the sort of translation to Breath of the Wild, uh, namely, like, dungeons, right? Like, we had the sort of four or five big tentpole areas in the game uh, where you had to go inside of a camel's body and, you know, rescue a fish woman or whatever it was. Um, but... Odyssey doesn't really feel like it's losing a lot of the sort of classic staples in the process. I will say now that I'm very endgame, um, it's starting to get a little uh, hide and seeky with stuff. Mm -hmm. It sort of feels like being in a giant grocery store and trying to pick out the things that you want rather than being like, that's where that is, that's where that is. In, yeah, in that sense, I think that that's very much a modern game. Yeah. Uh, you look at, you know, any, any big open world game and not everything in there is fun. Yeah. You know, and that's... that. It's sort of for better or for worse. It's like maybe the challenge is not so much completing the objective as it is enjoying completing the objective. It's like, you know, you always feel like, oh, what are the main quests? And there's like side quests. And you're like, oh, yeah. do I have to? But then to be like, I completed it. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know, if you don't 100% this game, it's, uh, it's that's okay. Like you can still get get your fun with it. But like you look at all the other games and they were like, they're kind of very very compact, you know, very yeah. much like there's a straight way to kind of go about it, you know, kind of speedrunners take it apart. Speedrunners are going to do really interesting stuff with Odyssey, uh, partially because of the motion controls being the fastest way to do some stuff, mm -hmm. but also because it is, like, so kind of sprawling and not Well, and you know? his, specifically his moveset has expanded to more than it ever was. I mean, if you look at the sort of the moveset that he's had before, the evolution has always been based on Mario 64, which actually stems from Mario vs. Donkey Kong. That was the first game, which was 2D, that let you do triple jumps, backflips, all that stuff that Mario was never known to do. And he can do all those perfectly. But now you're doing stuff like hat throw into a butt stomp that you cancel into a dive that you grab the hat and jump off of it. Uh, then you have enemy power-ups, right? Which we're seeing here. Just tons and tons of different things that completely add variety to the gameplay, totally change things up. Um, so using the skills of Mario as a sort of platforming god in synchronicity with the kind of power-ups and uh, translations of enemies that you can do in this game make for, I think, what's going to be some really special Let's Plays. But uh, because the game is so large, I do worry that this will be the Mario game that I go back to to 100% the least. Mm -hmm. Mario 64 is 120 stars, 150 if you count the DS version. It's the kind of game I can go to every couple of years and play through start to finish in completion. So, this is a little different. So. And, in, and in Gamer on our YouTube chat says, how are we supposed to... Oh, wrong one. Uh, the only thing I missed in Breath of the Wild was full-fledged dungeons. I think I comparing agree. Breath totally of the Wild and, and Mario... Because Mario, in a lot of ways, feels almost more like a Zelda game in that there are these sort of like different like different areas where Zelda was like, here's a big expanse. Uh, I think I think Mario Odyssey has better boss fights than Zelda did. Yeah. Uh, which is a weird thing to say. It feels odd, it feels odd and wrong to say that. Uh, At the same time, revisiting Zelda, you're also not going to really... I mean, you sort of have, but you're not going to... You're going to go back to it, but it's not like you're beating it. Yes. It's yeah. a different experience every time. Yeah, like when I, I went back, I mean, I actually said this after Breath of the Wild, and then I went back and played Master Mode. Um, we just got a question there. I just missed him. Um, it was uh, saying, basically, what makes this game different than the other? It's just like the other 3D Mario games. In reality, we haven't had a ton of those. So it's not like every year we get an Assassin's Creed. Every year we get a 3D Mario. We have Mario 64. We have Sunshine, which added the flood mechanic and also is a game you literally can't play unless you have GameCube hardware or you're emulating on PC. It's never been purported to anything. And Galaxy 1 and 2, which are very different than those two games. So really, this is only the third sort of open world-ish 3D Mario game. Uh, and I think that's what makes it so special. Yeah. So yeah, we're gonna be finding stuff in this game for years to come. I will say specifically, if you have the game and you can get to the ending, uh, do it sooner than later and then go back and get the other stuff because the post-game surprise after beating the main sort of campaign in that game, if you grew up playing Super Mario games like I did, is one of the most wonderful things they've ever done from a nostalgia sense. Uh, probably the best nostalgia Nintendo's ever done, period. Uh, and I really, really, really like it. And people were tweeting spoilers at me about it already, so it's out there. GIFs and everything, you'll see them. Um, 
So if you can get through that, get through that, beat Bowser. Spoilers, you know, he's the boss. Uh, and, and keep going from there. But yeah, let us know why you like this game, uh, what you're finding in it. Um, and it's a, yeah, it's a really good time to be into nerdy stuff. Like I want to plug we were... our guide real quick too, because it's, yeah, it's oh, tremendous. Yeah. I haven't had, I haven't looked at EX. I'm trying to find everything myself. Mm -hmm. But we uh, have been incredibly thorough with that game. Miranda Sanchez specifically, and a bunch of others here at IGN have done a tremendous job of putting every secret in that game into a very, very awesome place for you to uh, unpack. So. Uh, get in there if you get stuck and find those moons. Yeah, and I mean, as I'm starting to say, like we've got we got Mario, Assassin's Creed, Wolfenstein, uh, Thor tonight, Stranger Things came up last weekend, uh, Justice League's around the corner. It's six weeks from a new Star Wars movie, Battlefront Two, uh, Battlefront Two, uh, and then just there's so much good stuff right now. It's it's really kind of nice because it's going to start to get crappy outside. So uh, yeah, if the weather outside is is frightful, then play video games and watch TV and movies. Uh, we're going to be here every week, every Thursday. Yeah, um, Rolls right off the tongue. Yeah. Um, yeah, check out some of the other stuff we did. We do a podcast beyond the PlayStation show. Uh, head over to youtube.com slash IGN beyond. Uh, we put up a fun like Q&A, some goofy-ass Let's Plays. Uh, I dodged a bullet by not sitting in on the Let's Play for the new Bubsy game, which apparently, uh, you know, you got to check out. Um, maybe. I don't know. But... Uh, on that note, uh, also NVC. You yep. do that every week, yep. talking about yep. Nintendo stuff. We just did a, a new la launch of Let's Play series, which is a continuation of the Zelda one Zach Ryan and I did, uh, where we play Super Mario Odyssey with a Joy-Con in each hand with two people, uh, and very funny things happen. And also, you you previewed uh, Doom and Skyrim in VR. Yeah, we wanted to talk about this today. I totally uh, dropped the ball on that one. We got previews for Skyrim VR and uh, Doom VFR. Guess what the F stands for? It's fun. Um, but those are up on IGN on our YouTube too. Uh, that, those games are like, just playing Doom and Skyrim in VR is sort of a weird sensation on its own. Um, I don't have enough time with them to say if they're, they're definitely not perfect in the time I sent, but it's also like, it's a new experience. Yeah, you know, Getting totally. in there, figuring it out. Love it. Uh, so go check all that stuff out and uh, we'll be back next week with uh, more uh, hitting each other with children's toys. Thanks for joining us. My favorite noise. <laughs> <laughs>